So our next speaker is um, Graham Wood, who is a uh, journalist working at the uh, contributing editor to The Atlantic and The New Republic, uh, books editor of The Pacific Standard, and uh, has recently written, one could say, the, the article that has uh, created the buzz on apocalyptic jihad and raised a fair amount of controversy as a result of Peace in the Atlantic, very long and well-researched piece. Thank you, Graham. Uh, well, thank you very much, Richard, and uh, for the invitation, and also to several people at this conference who have been very generous with their time, uh, Cole, David Cook, uh, and, and Will as well. Um, You've been teaching me about the apocalypse and about ISIS ideology and its interest in, in these topics uh, after stu studying it for years or decades, and for me it's been months. So uh, it's very kind of you to make room for me at the conference. Um, I don't have the same deep knowledge of Muslim apocalyptic literature that a David Cook does, but I think I can claim some expertise, in, even in this crowd, on the topic of what happens to you when you write a viral article uh, about <laughs> apocalyptic themes that, that touch on these themes? And uh, what happens is that you start to reap a whirlwind of criticism. And largely that criticism I found has been based on sheer incredulity. Um, first, let me quickly describe the general conversation surrounding apocalypse that I detected while researching ISIS. Um, the ubiquitous references to apocalypse in Dabik magazine, uh, in the English language propaganda in general, in the beheading videos, these are all well known. Um, in interviewing supporters of ISIS, uh, I found that they nearly all brought up apocalyptic themes independent of my asking. Um, and the ones who did wait for me to ask were very happy to, to take on these themes and to elaborate on them, and to agree that the signs of the hour were mounting, uh, and that the Islamic State should be considered an agent of their arrival. Um, they were very excited about particular signs, the revival of slavery, uh, the line about the slave giving birth to her master, uh, the building of skyscrapers by uh, camel herders uh, as, as uh, as evidence with the, the rise of the Burj Khalifa in, in Dubai. Uh, but they also pointed to the generally lax moral attitudes that we, we find, the prevalence of uh, fornication, of titillating music, and uh, they would point also to the fact that Muslim ulama uh, don't like to talk about the apocalypse. They, were, they said, it, you know, if you find that the khutbas stop talking about the apocalypse, that's a sign. It's happening now. Um, uh, a large portion of my article was just asking simply what ISIS wants um, and what its supporters believe in their own words. Um, and in that limited sense, the article was very straightforward in its conclusions about apocalypse. They said that they uh, thought about it a lot and they were very eager to talk about it. The critics, to my knowledge, None of them attempted to say that ISIS doesn't mention apocalypse in its media production. Um, but many, I found, simply refused to believe that a modern movement might have these views, um, that it might have apocalyptic beliefs, and that it might take them seriously if it claims to have them. Um, some of them, I think, it would be fair to say they refuse a priori to believe that, that, on the grounds that they themselves would never believe such a thing, that someone else would believe it. Um, and you know, um, my own academic training was in philosophy, and there's a philosopher named David K. Lewis uh, who had some seemingly outlandish beliefs, and he, he would argue for them very, very clearly. And, and his uh, stock line and tried to uh, to refute uh, the reactions of his critics was to say, "I can't." refute an incredulous stare. And <laughs> often this was the way that I had to, to uh, respond to critics who said they cannot possibly believe what they're saying. Um, now, I can't tell you with full confidence that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi thinks that the apocalypse is near. Um, and I'm pretty sure no one else can say that with much, con with much confidence either. They, they can't tell you what the 
degree of his belief is. Um, I was just, I'll say, surprised to find how eagerly opponents of the view that ISIS has an apocalyptic dimension, how eagerly they declared victory and on what basis. Virtually any sign that ISIS supporters ever thought about anything else or that they lived in the secular world was going to be read as a sign that they were not doing any apocalyptic thinking at all. Repeatedly, I heard commentators point to the Ba'athist elements within ISIS or the evidence that one or another foreign fighter uh, had a DUI or a <laughs> citation for smoking pot in the year before he made hijra to the Islamic State and pronounce case closed. Um, these are secular people who can't possibly be serious about apocalypse. Um, the Der Spiegel piece from a few weeks ago, it said, apocalyptic visions alone are not enough to capture cities and take over countries which, uh, in reference to the, uh, the Haji Bakr documents about the methods of infiltration that, that ISIS was using with such success. Um, and in one sense, this is you know, trivially, tri trivially true. If, if you just have a bunch of apocalyptic views, that will not allow you to take over a city. But you need guns, food, trucks, um, gasoline, oxygen to breathe, things like this. But he continues, that is the author of the Spiegel piece, to say, that therefore there is essentially nothing religious in ISIS's actions, which is a statement that I think sweeps aside the stated apocalyptic perspective with, with again, remarkable confidence. For me, every time I detected another explicit reference to apocalypse from the supporters I spoke to, anytime the interviewer, uh, the interviewee brought up another sign of the hour, anytime a Executioner quoted the Hadith about the murder of pigs by the returned Jesus after his defeat of the Antichrist. This is just one data point, one kind of brick in the argumentative edifice that suggested that the apocalypse was something they were taking seriously. But to the opponents, um, I found that they, they viewed it not as a brick wall that could be chipped away at with counter evidence, such as the existence of secular Ba'athists in ISIS, it was more like a bubble, and that with any single prick, uh, the discovery of a Quran for dummies uh, in the Amazon.com basket of a foreign fighter, or the discovery that this or that Ba'athist within the organization had quite a whiskey collection, they seemed to think that that prick would, it would pop and you could ignore the apocalyptic elements from there, on, there, there onward. So, to be clear, I don't claim to know what ISIS as an institution thinks, only what the supporters who spoke to me said, what they said, and what the pro propaganda clearly states. Um, but one thing that became clear is that anyone who discards this element and who ignores the apocalyptic belief altogether is at least robbing himself or herself of a fascinating window into at least what some of the group's supporters think and how they think. The figure whom I quoted at greatest length on the subject was this Australian guy, uh, Australian convert, a bookworm named Musa Cerantonio. And he occupies and has never occupied any official office in the Islamic State. He's largely dormant as an online disseminator of ISIS propaganda and ideology. But at one point, he was a kind of nodal figure in some of their, some of their social networks and was uh, widely deferred to as someone who was saying true things about ISIS. I described Musa's apocalyptic beliefs in my article, and since its publication, he's come out with uh, an article of his own, um, a, a pamphlet, and he's been prosecuting a, a vigorous argument about the identity of, of Rome, as mentioned in the Hadith, uh, and which is supposed to show up and, and fight the Muslims at, uh, at Dabiq. And his detailed disquisition uh, is asking whether Rome, which clearly meant the Byzantines at some point, but now that there are no Byzantines around, must mean someone else. Uh, he goes through the possibility of what Rome could then mean. Should we identify Rome with a particular ethnic group, with a physical location? Uh, if, the, if a physical location, should it be the city of Rome? Should it be the Roman Empire? Should, be the, should it be the modern Italian Republic? Um, he asks, is it a type of government? Is it, should we identify it with the language? And he runs through the possibilities. Could Rome mean Rome? Could it mean the Vatican? Could it mean Italy? Could it mean Russia, since it, as the, uh, the inheritor of the Orthodox Church? Um, 
And eventually he comes down to the idea that the Ottomans defeated the Byzantines, they declared themselves the new Caesars of Rome, and that they inherited the mantle, and then when they were put down finally by the Turkish Republic, that that is what we should think of as Rome, and that is where the, the showdown will happen, a showdown at Davik between the Islamic State and the army of the Republic of Turkey. He very comfortably declares uh, takfir on the leaders of the Turkish Republic, and uh, he describes how Rome as the Turkish Republic makes sense. He says that the geography of al Amak and Dabik says, look, this is strategically important for Turkey, and we should, it would only make sense that Turkey would be the one that, that, would, that would, would fight us there. Um, he quotes the hadith, a hadith that says, uh, I'll quote here, they would fight such a fight, the likes of which uh, would, ever have, would ever be seen, so much so that even if a bird were to pass by their flanks, it would fall down dead before reaching the end of them. And he says, this is a description of aerial bombing. Um, Cher Antonio identifies with a particular uh, school, the Zaharis. He's a literalist to an almost comical degree. Um, and despite his clear support for the caliphate, he does offer it criticism, um, mostly because he considers it uh, insufficiently literal. Um, and this, I think, is part of why the apocalyptic element was so interesting to him. Um, the literal reading of apocalyptic literature, with proper nouns like Rome, um, that have such clear, uh, discrete, signified meanings, it's particularly, I think, hard to sustain that kind of reading in a manner that's consistent with observed reality. So I think he's taken up this challenge to show that the literal readings can still be a correct one to avoid speculation. Um, and he's also able to say that, yes, when my interpretation seems like a strange one, it's because the end times are strange. We should expect them to be very weird. And you know, the, the idea, so he quotes a hadith that says, uh, the last hour shall come when Rome constitutes the majority of people. Um, so think about that for a second in, in his worldview. He's suggesting that at some point, after the great tribulations, after the Antichrist, after Gog and Magog, after the death of the last Muslims, that citizens of the Kamalist Republic will be, be the majority of surviving human beings. And he says, in effect, that's weird. Uh, and he says, I pray that we will never see how this happens. <laughs> in some ways, I can see why it's hard to take this seriously. Um, after all, it's a guy sitting in his mom's living room, uh, speculating strangely about a series of events that would leave no one left on planet Earth except for Recep Tayyip Erdogan and a few of his friends. I asked him, I asked an Islamic State supporter whether he thought this was strange, and he, he showed at least that, that, that he, the one I asked, was aware of how odd it sounds. And I'll quote his res response at length because I enjoyed it so much. This is him speaking. He says, what, what stands out to me that others don't seem to discuss much is how the Islamic State, Osama bin Laden and others, are operating as if they are reading from a script that was written 1400 years ago. They not only follow these prophecies, but plan ahead based on them. One would therefore assume that the enemies of Islam would note this and prepare adequately. But it's almost as if they feel that playing along would mean that they too believe in the prophecies, and so instead they ignore them and go about things their own way. Uh, an example of all this, he said, I'm continuing in his voice, an example of this was when an Israeli off advisor suggested planting the Tharkad tree all around military bases, <laughs> government buildings, and airports, because it was said by the prophet that during the Great War, the, the Malhama, a Jew would hide behind a rock or a tree, and the rock or tree would call out to the Muslim, telling him, a Jew is behind me, come kill him. Except the Garkad tree would not do this, it would conceal the Jew. Based on this, the Israeli advisor figured that it would be a great idea to plant these trees everywhere, <laughs> as if he could fight destiny by this trick. The plan was obviously thrown out as being absurd, perhaps above all because it assumes that the Muslims and their religion are correct, and that Israel should not operate based on prophecies from 1400 years ago that ultimately say that the Jews will be defeated. This story explains in some ways how the enemies of the Muslims may be aware of what the Muslims are planning, but it won't benefit them at all, as they prefer to either keep their heads in the sand 
or to fight their imaginary war based upon rational, freedom-loving Democrats versus irrational, evil terrorist madmen. With this in mind, maybe you can understand to some degree why one of the reasons why many Muslims will share your piece in the Atlantic, he writes to me. It's not because we don't understand what it's saying in terms of how to defeat Muslims. Rather, it's because we know that those in charge will ignore it and screw things up anyway. <laughs> I'll end by saying that uh, it, it takes one to know one. So among the most memorable responses to my piece was by a young woman who, like Musa Cerantonio, very smart, energetic, whom I had met years before when she was one of the most active members of a group called the Westboro Baptist Church. This is the group that pickets the funerals of American servicemen and women, saying that God is punishing America for permissive attitudes toward homosexuality. She had recently left the church and was still recovering from the effects of her, at that point, life lifelong membership. She said, in effect, that the incredulity my piece received mirrored the incredulity that people had toward the Westboro Baptist Church. She said most people simply could not or would not believe uh, what, that what she insisted uh, is the truth, that, that Westboro believes what it says. They could not believe that people could actually think that this is the response, that this is the reason that they were uh, tirelessly holding up placards about uh, the death of American soldiers. Part of what they believed was also that the apocalypse was near and that the noisy protests that they were making were actually an attempt to hasten it by binding people to the word of God, by making them aware of it, and once everybody was aware of it, then the apocalypse would start. Now, she is not an apocalypse expert. I mean, she's not an ISIS expert. She, what she knows about it came, I think, largely from my article. But she did speak with some expertise on the reaction of the general public, and especially the non-believing public, to apocalyptic and extreme religious thinking. The first reaction, to doubt its sincerity, and then to take any scrap of evidence at all to the contrary. The fact that a church member had a wild youth, or uh, had a well-funded uh, IRA, anything that suggested that they were thinking in, in the long term that, uh, in, and about a reality that might include something other than uh, a, 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 a swiftly uh, hastened apocalypse. That was seized upon evidence that they actually just didn't believe. Um, and she became very well acquainted with, the, with incredulous stares. Um, but you know, she herself, she refused to marry because she believed the end was soon. I saw her actually just last week. She was on her way to Holland and she said, the reason I have a passport is because I thought I would have to go to Israel soon to convert 144,000 Jews in the last days as, as described in the book of Revelation. So I expect that someday we'll have enough testimony from returnees from the Islamic State to tell us a little bit more about the Muslim versions of these beliefs and how they've played out. Um, but instead, for now, the facts that we have, I think, are suggestive. Um, some of the foreign fighters who have gone there, they didn't just obtain passports so they could go there, they obtained them, used them, and then burned them while repeating the apocalyptic line. And I take that as firmer evidence for the seriousness of their apocalyptic thinking than a Quran for Dummies purchase two years ago might be as evidence for the contrary. Thank you.